Hey guys, it's Adam from Lucipixel and welcome back. Now, today's video, today's talk is dedicated to a very dear friend of mine who I haven't seen in a really long time. I'm 45 now and I think the last time we saw each other was at least 15 years ago, if I'm not mistaken. And that's because he moved. He ended up moving to New York City, my friend Gino. So today's video is dedicated to you, my friend. We probably haven't heard from each other in a very long time, but rest assured you've been in my thoughts. So why am I dedicating this video to him? Because he was there at a point in my life when I feel, it was one of those times in my life I really feel felt I hit rock bottom. Now, of course, I'm not going to get into all the personal details. I'm not going to annoy you with that. It's not a reality TV show, so stop being so nosy. Um, although I'm sitting here telling you my life story to you. Um, it was at a point in my life where sometimes life really kicks your ass more times than you feel you can handle. And I'm sure you can relate to that. And it wasn't just professionally. It was kind of where, you know, when one domino falls, then the rest of them fall in sequence. And it was personal, it had to do with my love life, it had to do with fatherhood, it had to do with professional, with my professional life as, a, as, an, as, a, as an artist. And everything seemed to coincide at the same time. And it just kind of hit this tipping point where everything fell apart and I hit rock bottom. And thankfully, I had, I had people around me who I, cared, who I cared a lot about. My friend Gino, my sister was there for me as well to help pull me through this. And I want to walk you through a, a generalization of what I went through because there's going to be a point to it in the end of all this and a point that is going to relate to you, I absolutely guarantee it. And something that hopefully will, will take a little bit of load off for you. I was working as a professional, as a professional artist, and um, in a studio, it was one of my first big gigs working in a studio. And I was a new dad. So there was a lot of responsibility going on there. It was very exciting, but uh, a lot of stresses that came with it too, but good and bad stresses that come with parenthood, that kind of stuff. And, and at the same time, I was also getting into the world of dance at the same time too. So it was kind of like that a period in my life where there, I was really heavily emotionally involved in a lot of different things. I was heavily emotionally involved in my career, in my personal life, in my relationships. And I was also very heavily involved in this new passion I discovered, the passion of dance. So much of myself was tied into what I did. It still is today. But it was really at a point of discovery. So this was very important and very exciting for me. And then things started to fall apart. And over the period of about, I'd say about a year, a year and a half, I fought to maintain all of these things. I fought to keep it. It's like that, I remember that, that expression from Fight Club that I love. What you own ends up owning you, right? And if, you, if the things you have in your life are holding you together, if those things fall apart, then you'll fall apart with it. And my relationships started to fall apart and in a very stressful way. It was a very, a very, it wasn't, it wasn't a regular difficult situation where, you know, you just kind of, kind of dwindling. It was a really intense falling apart. <laughs> it was a very uh, intense relationship, intense at the beginning and intense at the end as well. And all of this was kind of starting to hit a crux and that was starting to infiltrate its way into my personal life, into my professional life as well, because, you know, you've got all this shit going on in your life and then uh, you're trying to put on a brave face at work at the same time. And when that wor these two worlds start to collide, it puts you in an extra stressful situation. On top of that, this passion I had, this artistic passion that I had was very big, very, very important part of my life, which was dance, was also taking a hit because all of these things tied together. So everything was getting rattled. And it put me into this position at this point in my life where I hadn't yet figured out my integrity. I hadn't yet figured out um, 
how to hold my own and how to balance myself. I was kind of a very all or nothing type of guy. So, you know, I felt like if this falls apart, then everything falls apart. There's no middle ground. There's no balance to this. It's just, you know, I had this wonderful thing and now it's all falling to shit. And I was, it threw me into this year, year and a half period of panic where I was essentially always feeling that, that, that sort of Damocles dangling over my head, waiting to drop. I was, I basically was, I was, I was predicting my own demise in a sense. So I, I, it started off as this period of, of, of discovery and excitement and joy uh, and growth and very quickly started to turn into this situation of fear and panic and insecurity and desperation. Um, and it all started to get tighter and tighter around my neck over that period of a year and a half. And then one day it broke everything that that thin wire holding all of this together snapped. And within the period of, I'd say a week or two, I lost it all. I lost my relationship, finally tipped over the edge and it, it, and it, it, it broke. And then I, within 24 hours of that, um, I, I felt like the world of dance had also been taken away from me. And then within a week of that, which was on my birthday, believe it or not, just to add insult to injury, um, I am told one day that I really had to get some work out. It was a really important project we had to get done. We have some clients that need to see it. Can you, can you work extra hard today and get it done? And it was my birthday. And I'm like, okay, fine. I just hope I don't have to do overtime or anything like that because I did want to go home and celebrate. And they're push, push, push. And they do that. And at the end of the day, they say, great work. You did a great job. You did a great job, Adam. And then within 15 minutes of delivering it to the client, I get a call from HR. Adam, could you please uh, come to HR? Adam Duff, can you please come to HR? And I go to HR and they tell me that I'm canned. They sacked me. <laughs> so basically... You know, I'm already, I'm already down. It's like Dark Souls. You know, I'm already on the ground, but they're just pummeling a, a, a wet husk of flesh at this point. I'm already dead. Uh, and I was already pretty defeated. And the reason being is because I had, I had brought up to HR, something I mentioned in the past in other talks, I'd brought up to HR that there was um, one of the directors that was being very verbally abusive. Um, and he was stealing everybody's work at the same time. So, um, yeah. So they call me into the office and the HR, the woman at HR who told me that I was really made the right move. It was great move to come and talk to me about this. It was the diplomatic decision to make and it was smart and we appreciate it. Sacked me for approaching her with this, with this issue. And I walked out of there, um, kind of like feeling like light Yagami when he finally realizes that near got him after that entire time trying to hold on to everything the the gig is up buddy you got caught and i'm walking out of there this blithering giggling mess feeling like i've basically you know i didn't think i had anything left and you just plucked it out of me and i felt a complete sense of defeat and then i walked out of the i, wa I walked into the elevator i've described this in other talks in the past i walked into the elevator which was about a 15 second walk from the HR department. And I got in the elevator, it went down two floors, that's it. And by the time I that those elevator doors opened and I walked out, I felt liberated. But I didn't only feel liberated from that job. I felt liberated from my life. I felt, how can I describe it? I, I realized something of, hugely Im crucial importance. And that's the point of what I want to share with you today. It's, I realized after losing, um, after losing my partner, after losing, I felt my connection to the world of dance that I'd fallen so deeply in love with, which of course didn't happen, but it felt that it, I was convinced of it at the time and losing my job. 
realized that after all of that, there was one thing I didn't lose. And this is going to sound like a freaking Hallmark card, but it's true. I didn't lose myself. In fact, I didn't lose myself. I feel I found myself. Because I realized that when you take every single... When, when I realized that when everything I had was taken away from me, when I was left with nothing but the carcass that is Adam, I'm still here. And fundamentally, it comes down to one thing at that point. It comes down to a choice. A choice of whether or not I choose to be a good person or a bad person. I could use this as an excuse. I could have very easily used my shortcomings, my my uh, my unforeseen, unexpected, horrible circumstances. These this unfair situation I had to endure, the victim I was, and I could have turned that. I could have looked at that and said, "Fuck life, fuck everything, screw you all, screw everything." I give up. I could have chosen to do that. I, and in the same breath, I could have chosen to not do that. I could choose to be a complete dick and use this as an excuse to be an asshole to everybody or to, you know, when in Rome, do like the Romans do and decide to be a cutthroat myself or decide to be a jerk to people myself. And I decided not to. I had the choice. People can do to me whatever they decide to do. I'll never have control, no matter how good or bad I think that person is. I will never, ever have control over the things that anybody does to me, ever. It's not up to me. It's up to them. It's called free will. But I can choose how to reciprocate. I can choose how to respond. I can choose how to be affected by these things. And I realized and I decided at that point that I only had control over my own circumstances and my own choices. And that ultimately is what makes me who I am. I am not what has happened to me. I am not what will happen to me. I am what I choose to be right now. And it's that sense of right now, it's that sense of immediacy. And furthermore, it's that sense of self it's where I discovered who I was when you take all of that, all of those bells and whistles and all that bling and bedazzle away. Who am I at my most fundamental core? I am nothing but a human being who has the freedom to decide right from wrong. I can choose left or I can choose right. That is entirely up to me. And it's at that point that I realized what I was capable of controlling in my life and what I wasn't. And I, I was up until that point, I was somebody that if I was walking down the street, minding my own business with my headphones on and my hoodie over my head in my own little bubble, and somebody decided to walk by me and give me a look and go, huh, or look at me and give me a, what the hell's your problem? That I could, sp I'm sure you can relate to this, that I would walk down the street and I'd probably spend the next half an hour sitting in my head thinking to myself, why the hell did they do that to me? I didn't do anything. I would, I would get defensive in my brain even if I didn't do anything I would get defensive in my brain and I would sit there and think and, and fester over why the hell this person gave me that look in the first place why why did that person give me that judgment call and the reason I would be festering over that is because if you think about it I wasn't I didn't have that sense of self I didn't know who I was and what I was so that when somebody gave me a look it threw me into a state of questioning my self-worth why did they do that and, and when people get defensive, why people will give them funny looks or will say rude or mean or, or judgmental things to you, that, um, that it throws, your, it throws your, your sense of self out of whack because you are never deciding for yourself in the first place. You are letting other people decide that for you. And as soon as you see yourself truly at your core, who you truly are, it allows yourself to be able to analyze yourself in a more objective third person type of perspective. And if somebody would look at me and give me a funny look, or if somebody would look at me and be mean or do something snide or conniving or rude or judgmental, I already know who I am. So if somebody does that, I can objectively look at my own behavior and say, did I do anything right or wrong? 
I know the diff difference. I know if I said something rude. I know if I pushed somebody's buttons. I know if I rattled somebody's cage. I know if I was a flat-out dick to somebody. I know when I am. And if a person gives me a look, I'll just look at it and I'll recognize what they did and I will recognize it as their behavior. If somebody gives me a funny look, I'll say, is there something wrong? And they'll go, <laughs> stupid. And I go, okay, well, that person's calling me stupid. Am I stupid? Well, I know I'm not. So there must be something up with them. And I very, very casually say, if there's something, if I've done something to upset you, let me know and I'll correct that behavior. But until then, you can sit there and make as many funny faces as you want. I'm not a mind reader, so I'll leave it to you. And I can walk away from that situation with zero impact on my ego. Because I know when I've done something right or wrong. And unless somebody tells me I've done something wrong, if I don't recognize what I've done wrong myself, nothing I can do about it. Now, what I've just painted for you is a single scenario of a single situation, in a single period in my life. And I've had countless times like that in my life. That I can remember as being one of those, quote, adrenaline moments in my life. One of the moments that were so, it was so to me at the time, devastatingly terrible that, um, at least on my, on my, on my being, it rattled me at my core so much that it stuck in my head. But I can say with complete confidence, as I'm sure you can too, you've experienced a lot of those yourself. You've had your heart ripped in half. You have dealt with the pain of abandonment and loneliness. You've been riddled with self-doubt. You have been overwhelmingly humiliated about something you might have made a complete ass of yourself maybe you behaved in a way that you're completely ashamed of maybe you lost your temper in a situation where you just felt horrible about yourself or maybe you made a decision in your life that could have put you or somebody else in, a, in in danger and you were stupid and you weren't thinking and you feel this amazing amount of regret and you walk around with these with this weight on your shoulders of all of the good and bad that you have been the, the result of you've been the cause of and what i'm telling you is when it comes down to it you are who you are today you are who you decide to be today and where does all of this, this big spiel, where does all of this tie into my friend Gino? Because when I hit rock bottom, when I was sitting there uh, literally giggling with lunacy at how completely lost I felt, overwhelmed with everything that was going on, I was in his car and Gino in all of his wisdom, in all of his Italianness. <laughs> says to me, he was the one driving the car and he said, Adam, don't sweat the small stuff. And then he goes, and then I said, don't sweat the small stuff. And he goes, no, don't sweat the small stuff. And remember something important. Everything is small stuff. And what, he, what that basically made me realize at this point is that how I felt, how I was reacting was all created by myself how I chose to react, how I chose to be affected by, how I chose to allow this to impact my life, the perspective it gave me of myself, the script that I had written in my head of who I was and how external factors were all the catalysts to who I'd become up until that point were entirely a creation of my own will. I decided to feel that way and act that way based on the circumstances that have been dealt with me. And that's why you can look at, you know, sometimes you can look, you can look at somebody who's, who's, who broke a nail and they can, they can cry and throw a fit and walk, run up and down the street screaming their head about it. Or you can see a nurse who's just treated her, her 9,000th COVID victim who has lost the fight. And the nurse can sit there and go, there's always tomorrow. Got to keep going. Got to keep trying her best. And she can stay stoic and focused through that shit when somebody else can completely lose their shit over something trivial. And it's very easy to look at the person who's lo lost their shit over something trivial and say, and think to yourself, they're weak. They're, they're self-centered. They're egotistical. They're spoilt. 
And I would argue that they're not. I would argue that they just haven't discovered themselves yet. Maybe they've spent the last 15 years of their life petrified about being caught ugly one day or being petrified about being judged by other people because they hadn't yet hit rock bottom. They hadn't yet discovered for themselves that even when there's nothing left, they still have themselves. Up until that point in your life, everything is big stuff and everybody in their life needs a friend like Gino to say everything's small stuff. And that's what I'm telling you today. Nobody cares what you've been through. Nobody cares what you're going to go through. Nobody cares how many times you've been fired. Nobody cares how many times you've embarrassed yourself. Nobody cares how many times you've been awkward and antisocial and people looked at you funny. Nobody cares how many times you got overly enthusiastic about something in a group full of people who are quote, cool. I hate cool people. <laughs> people who are cool and they looked at you like thinking you say, you're a bit of a, you're a bit, you're a little bit over, why don't you calm down? You're being a little bit of a spaz right? Nobody cares about any time you've posted your 700th YouTube video or your 9,000th artistic post and got zero reaction from it. Nobody cares. All that matters is that you look at yourself and say, did I try my best? Yes. Did I make my best effort? Yes. Or did I make a good enough effort? It doesn't have to be your, you don't have to freaking, you don't have to crush it every time. Did you just make your best effort? Yeah, I did. Did I do anything deliberately to hurt another pe person's feeling? No. Did I do anything to impact the, anybody else's well-being? No. Then stop taking yourself so fucking seriously. Stop sweating the small stuff. Now, if you did, if you did do something, if you're, I don't know, a hypothetical situation, a well-known artistic YouTuber who was called out for... Uh, for doing something that very much impacts the well-being of other people and that can have a lasting damaging impact on the lives of others, then you need to see yourself. You need to look at yourself and say, I caused other people serious, long-lasting harm. And an apology and uh, knowing yourself isn't going to get you out of that. You're going to have to fucking do harder than that. But... If you haven't done any of those things and you're, you're just somebody trying your best, making your best effort, just trying to make ends meet, just trying to make a name for yourself and maybe you're not the most successful person on earth and maybe you're a little bit shy and awkward and antisocial, don't worry about it. Don't sweat the small stuff. And remember, everything is small stuff. All right. And with that said, I love you all with all my heart and happy painting. Take care.